Dr. John Dee, an advisor to Queen Elizabeth I and one of the foremost scholars in 16th century England, was the very definition of a Renaissance man. He had interests in astrology, in science, in mathematics, and in the occult. And that seems like a weird mix today, but he was at the forefront of scholarship in England at the time and is the man that many credit with originating the very idea of a British Empire. A um, misunderstood and much maligned historical character, he was a collector of rare books who at one time held one of the largest libraries on earth, and although he died in poverty and obscurity, his ideas powerfully affected society both then all the way through to today. And he represented an era when science and religion and mysticism were all intertwined. Dr. John Dee deserves to be remembered. We know that Dee was born at approximately 2 p.m. on July 13, 1527, because he created his own birth chart, which is still in existence and resides at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Born to Roland Dee, a merchant, and Joanna Wilde, the latitude on Dee's chart shows that he was born on the north side of London. Dee was a promising scholar as a young man, excelled at St. John's College, Cambridge, and was granted entry into Henry VIII's new Trinity College. The subject he was most passionate about was mathematics. At the time, math was regarded with suspicion as a type of magic. Some considered the calculations of math to be synonymous with conjuring or black magic. Certain math books were burned because of this association. Dee didn't let others' view of the subject deter him. In a preface to the classic work Elements by Euclid, which was printed in 1570, Dee wrote that thaumaturgy, the word for the mathematical arts, giveth certain order to make strange works of the sense to be perceived of men greatly to be wondered at. Dee used his understanding of mathematics and mechanics to stage a wonder in Trinity's main hall. He was participating in a production of the play Peace by Aristophanes, a Greek playwright. In the play, a man desires to speak to the gods on Mount Olympus, and in the script, the man climbs atop a giant beetle and flies up to the mountain to speak to the gods. The flying beetle John Dee created for the play was so astonishing that some viewers accused him of using magic to create the illusion of flight. Dee would respond to his critics by writing. And for these, and such like marvelous acts and feats, naturally, mathematically, and mechanically wrought and contrived, ought any honest student and modest Christian philosopher be counted and called a conjurer, condemned as a companion of the hellhounds, and a caller of conjured or wicked and damned spirits? In reality, Dee probably used a combination of mirrors, springs, and air compressors to create the illusion, but he did not leave the details to history. This early success built an air of mystique that surrounded Dee for the rest of his life. After making a successful lecture on geometry in Paris, he traveled to Louvain in modern-day Brussels to continue his education at the university. There he met Gerardus Mercator, who was one of the foremost cartographers of the day. Mercator used math to develop a way of recording the curved surface of the Earth in a manner that had not been used before and is still used in nautical maps today. They became such close friends that Dee would write in his diary. It was the custom of our mutual friendship and intimacy that, during three whole years, neither of us willingly lacked the other's presence for as much as three whole days. Mercator gave Dee gloves depicting the world and another showing the heavens using his new method of map making. It was at this time that Dee may have started imagining how the universe actually functioned. Nicholas Copernicus had posited a few years prior that perhaps the sun was the center of the galaxy and not the earth. This idea was revolutionary and in some circles considered heretical. Dee made the acquaintance of Sir William Pickering, an English ambassador in Brussels, and became a tutor in Pickering's household. The Holy Roman Emperor Charles V offered Dee a position at his court, but Dee refused the position in a Catholic monarchy and returned to his homeland, Protestant England, which was now under the reign of Henry VIII's only son, Edward. Two of Edward's advisors, Robert, Robert Ashcam and John Cheek, had gone to school with Dee, and through his connections, Dee presented some of his astronomy studies to the young king, who enjoyed them and gave Dee a small income. He joined the household of John Dudley, the Duke of Northumberland, in 1552. But then King Edward died, and England was thrown into turmoil. Dudley attempted to place Lady Jane Grey on the throne instead of the Catholic Mary, daughter of Henry VIII and Queen Catherine. Dudley failed and was executed in August 1553. Dee, though accused by his detractors as worshipping the devil, was actually a very religious man. He believed that studying nature through science was another way to worship God. But Dee was arrested by agents of Queen Mary during the persecution of Protestants under her reign. He was accused of, among other things, endeavoring by enchantments to destroy Queen Mary. 
The charge didn't stick, but the rectorship and income King Edward had given him was taken away, and it was given to Edmund Bonner, the Bishop of London, to be examined for heretical behavior. Dee was in Bonner's household and acted as a chaplain during the years Bonner would earn the nickname Bloody Bonner for his role in suppressing Protestants in England. When Queen Mary died and her half-sister Elizabeth, the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, took the throne, many believed Dee would be cast out of favor like Bonner was. But Queen Elizabeth seemed to favor the philosopher and astrologer, even asking his advice for the most propitious day to hold her coronation. Some historians believe that Dee had been acting as a spy for Elizabeth during his time in Bonner's home, but there's no evidence to support that claim beyond the fact that he wasn't thrown into prison like Bonner was. Dee began his life's work, which was to find a universal language in nature, and studied the Kabbalah, a type of Hebrew mysticism. This universal language, Dee believed, was told to the biblical Adam by God in the fabled Garden of Eden before the fall from grace. Dee hypothesized if a scientist could find this universal language, giving the secret name of beast, plants, and everything in creation, that it would unlock the secrets of the universe itself. To that end, Dee wrote one of his most famous works, the Manus Hieroglyphica, combining all astrological symbols into one. Dee may have influenced the course of world history when he presented another work, general and rare memorials pertaining to the perfect art of navigation to Elizabeth. It was a text not just about navigation, but also about the importance of Great Britain having a standing navy. Elizabeth's divine right to the Northern Isles, which was in conflict with a papal bull dividing the earth between certain countries, and also, for perhaps the first time, putting into words the nebulous idea of a British Empire. It was a curious book, both scholarly and mystical, featuring an allegorical artwork on the front, with Elizabeth on a ship being guarded over by an archangel and a woman representing opportunity. These ideas weren't adopted immediately, but over time, the Navy and the British Empire became important ideas in British foreign policy. Dee was one of the few commoners Elizabeth would visit, stopping by his home at Mortlake when Dee's mother and wife died to offer her condolences. She was fascinated by Dee's theories and also believed in mystical ideas like the power of the royal touch, which she believed was her ability to cure various illnesses simply by touching the afflicted person. Though she favored Dee, Queen Elizabeth would not provide the money he needed to continue his research. He enjoyed a modest income as the rector of Long Lednam, but to supplement this, he cast horoscopes and attempted alchemical heels to pay for his additional expenses. One of his busy, biggest expenses was his mammoth collection of books. With the upset of the monasteries and other centers of learning in England, many libraries had been liquidated and their contents were sold to private collectors outside of the country. Dee was obsessed with saving these rare and precious works from disappearing and built wings and additional rooms on his home to store them. Through his efforts, Dee accumulated one of the largest libraries in Europe, with books on almost any topic imaginable, from dreams to mythology and the weather. Dee was at his home at Mortlake when he began experimenting with scryers, or men who could see images in mirrors or crystals. There were many fortune tellers and scryers wandering throughout England at the time, practicing their trade for lodging, food, or whatever payment was available. The purpose of these sessions, which Dee called actions, in his highly detailed diary he kept about them, was to find the secret universal language that had so long evaded him. Edward Kelly, though he introduced himself to Dee under a fake name Talbot, was Dee's most famous scrying partner. Kelly, over years and numerous sessions, said he saw any number of angels, demons, and other spirits sharing with Dee their advice, tables filled with numbers purportedly used for the purpose of casting horoscopes, and a completely new language which later occultists would call the Enochian alphabet. Kelly's past was questionable, and in Dee's diary, Dee wrote, I had confirmed Talbot was a Cosner, which is another word for a fraud. But their relationship continued to be close, and Kelly had access to Dee's private papers, because on the same page where Dee had written Kelly was a fraud, Kelly had written that this was a horrible and slanderous lie. Dee and Kelly would flee England together with their families, because according to a vision, Kelly believed he was soon to be arrested. They traveled to Europe with a Polish noble named Albert Lasky, but soon parted ways with Lasky because he didn't have the resources to keep them. Dee and his squire went to Bohemia in modern-day Poland and, through some connections, met Emperor Rudolf II, a man who shared many of Dee's interests and was sometimes referred to as the Mad Alchemist. Rudolf received a message from Dee that Dee claimed to have received from angels during one of his actions with Kelly. The message encouraged Rudolf to be humble, and if he would worship God, he would be one of the strongest leaders in Europe. Rudolf was initially receptive to the message and showed Dee the many wonders he had collected in his palace, which included the roots of a mandrake plant, the remains of what Rudolf believed was a dragon, and a narwhal horn. 
But the Catholic ambassador to Rudolf's court thought Dee's message and spiritual experiments were heretical and advised the Pope of Dee's activities. The ambassador gave Emperor Rudolf evidence of what he claimed as proof of Dee's practicing prohibited arts, and as a result, Rudolf banished Dee and Kelly from his kingdom. The pair were then under the protection of Wilhelm Rosenberg, a bohemian noble who was seeking an alchemical cure for his inability to produce an heir. Dee and Kelly stayed for years, performing their spiritual actions and receiving more information from Kelly's scrying, including instructions to share their wives. Eventually, Kelly became known for his so-called alchemical abilities, including transforming worthless materials into gold, and after being asked back to Emperor Rudolf's court, they parted ways. Dee returned to England and discovered that his library was in ruins. A large part of his magnificent collection was missing, and other valuable pieces of equipment had been smashed. Never particularly adept at court politics, Dee retired to his Martlick estate, continued to seek the universal language through other scryers, but he never had the sort of success that he enjoyed with Kelly again. Some sources say Dee died in December 1608, but in Dee's personal diary on March 26, 1609, there's a small picture of a skull, leading other historians to believe that he died in March. In 1653, 50 years after his death, John Dee's journals regarding his actions with Edward Kelly were published as a book that was titled A True and Faithful Relation of What Passed for Many Years Between Dr. John Dee and Some Spirits. It was popular, the public couldn't get enough of it, but it was portrayed as a dark work and it tarnished his reputation. Scholars at the time argued that he must have been duped because they said angels would never behave the way that the spirits that he had written about did. In the Victorian era, the occult society the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn examined these papers and used his angelic writings to create a type of magic that they called Enochian. The notorious mystic Aleister Crawley, a member of the Golden Dawn who would break away to start his own magical order, believed himself to be the reincarnation of Dee's scryer, Edward Kelly. But 20th century re-examinations of his accomplishments have placed greater context around his tarnished image, and it yet remains true that he helped to advance and to popularize mathematics and cartography, and that he founded the very idea of a British Empire. And it's important to note that many of his works were written in English rather than Latin, making them much more accessible than other scientific works at the time. He sought the words of angels where the words of science failed him, for example, in trying to heal the rift between the Roman Catholic Church, the Reformed Church of England, and the Protestant movement. And his dabbling in the occult was hardly unique at the time. Even Sir Isaac Newton was said to have searched for the Philosopher's Stone. Dee finally said, I have found that neither any man living, nor any work that I could yet meet with all, has been able to teach me those truths that I desired and longed for. And so he asked, the angels. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow the History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.